And on mic today, we have Arch Hall Jr. How are you this evening? Very good, Aaron. Very good. How are you? Uh, I'm quite well. I'm excited to have you here. I have in front of me here a legitimate rock star, a legitimate movie star, a pilot, and a world traveler. So I, I don't even know where to start first. <laughs> I, you, I like following your adventures on Facebook. You have the most interesting things to post on there. Um, <laughs> I, I guess I should just start off by saying I got to know you through your movies. So I should probably just kind of ask how you got started in that. Sure. Uh, that's a fair question. Uh, and the answer is I was sort of born into it. Uh, my father, whose name is Archall Sr., by the way, uh, not to be confused with me, Junior, but he uh, he aspired to be an actor early in his life. And uh, after growing up in uh, South Dakota as a cowboy, actually a real cowboy, uh, he went out to Hollywood and went out, well, I went out to he was involved in the Pasadena Playhouse and a bunch of stage uh, acting and everything. And then he also got an agent and tried to get involved in the movies. This is about 19. I'm going to say about 1931, 30, maybe 31. He actually he actually hopped a train, a freight train during the Depression and uh, rode out, stayed in what they called then hobo jungles, which um, <laughs> unfortunately I think have returned, but we call them something else. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, ha- he, he was just on the cusp of kind of breaking in because he was a strikingly handsome guy, a rodeo rider, and a, a true cowboy, and of course, cowboy films were very popular uh, then, as well as a little later. But he had to return to South Dakota because of family uh, issues and uh, severe weather and illness, and uh, so he abandoned that. And he only returned after he had gotten married to my mother, and uh, they were married in 1934. So he returned in about 1936, I believe, 37, and then he became quite active in. Uh, Around 1938 in the early 40s, uh, except the war, of course, uh, came into play there. Uh, but he was uh, did a lot of uh, films, mostly for Republic, a company called Republic. You're probably familiar with the early cowboy films. I am. Monogram Films was another one. And there's some other independents. And, uh, but uh, they filmed pretty much around the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles there, which at that time was terrific open country and orange groves and everything you wouldn't recognize you know what it looks what it looked like back then but uh, I've seen pictures very beautiful anyway to make a long story short um, sort of uh, the war came in uh, you know Pearl Harbor uh, he uh, went in the Army Air Corps as did many of his Hollywood friends that were also aspiring actors and directors and writers uh, and uh, so he didn't come out the other side for a few years and then went back and tried to reestablish himself. But, you know, having a family and then having me, I came along. Uh, I'm an only child, by the way, I should mention that. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, having a family sort of puts a damper on a lot of things. So you have to get a regular gig. And that's what he sort of did for many, many years uh, in many, many different diverse uh, businesses. Uh, at one time, he was even asked to be a, uh, uh, a speech writer in California, Sacramento, for the for the California Democratic Party, and uh, he declined that based on uh, the, uh, some of the people involved at that time in politics in California. Uh, he d- didn't care for too much. He, he thought they were pretty slippery people, so uh, yeah, it was a good offer, but he turned it down. Mm-hmm. Uh, However, he never went back to films until until he, uh, uh, I guess he was in his 50s. And so this really goes a long period of time. He was in radio, other things. But to make a long story short, he, he gets back in as an independent uh, writer, producer, uh, starting his own films, but really not knowing anything about the business other than what he had experienced uh, in the late 30s and early 40s. So... First film he did was in 1959. It's called The Choppers, and uh, I was in it. And to sort of answer, you know, how you how you came about getting in films. Uh, my father's is a passion with him writing, especially writing. And 
so he kind of created his own. He returned to what he really loved and had a passion for. Um, and, uh, you know, he used assets that were at his disposal. And uh, I was one of them. So <laughs> he, uh, so he, uh, and, I, and I didn't volunteer anything. It's, it's what you do. If your father was a, uh, owned a plumbing company or, or electrical contractor or whatever, you, you'd grow up probably sometimes having to go out and help dad and things like that. So that's, that's how it sort of came about. Okay. Okay. Well, that's, that is really interesting. And you, you went from there, you made a couple movies. Um, so did your dad choose your movie roles or was that something that you kind of had a hand in? Well, I think, I think again, kind of returning to, to what, uh, using his background and his um, and his uh, uh, passion for writing and coming up with crazy. He had uh, comedy shows on the radio. He was a radio, live radio performer, actor, and uh, announcer, straight announcer, and news person as well. And would have transitioned into television, except for a few other problems he had. One being smoking. He had a terrible um, cough, and it mm-hmm. became an issue. Uh, on radio, you can use a cough button up to a point. And then, but on television, what do you do? You know, right. So his, um, uh, unfortunately, his uh, his smoking habit, which uh, he was up to like five packs a day, I think. In the, oh my! In the height of the radio, and this is you know back in the Edward R. Murrow days, where you know everybody, the whole news. Oh yeah, it was clouds of smoke. It's just a culture. It was, and and it, uh, but there was a downside, and and that sort of took its toll on him in making the transition, which would have been a natural one for him. Uh, making the transition from uh, from uh, radio to television, but um, what was the last part of your question? Maybe I forgot it. Or got oh it. no, no, you, you hit it right on the head there. I was just asking uh, how how you managed to get the particular roles you had because just looking at the, the parts you had, they would be very appealing roles for a young man and uh, much better the roles than I would expect a, a early actor to, to get otherwise. Well, I think he he tried to uh, be pragmatic too, and his uh, company located in Burbank, uh, which was a, sort of a compound of a uh, of a combined office apartment, uh, commercial, partial residential uh, building. Uh, it became sort of ground zero. We called it the compound, and um, he identified people, other producers, other independents, you know, people, uh, uh, well, many of them I can't quite think of right now. I mean, uh, Roger Corman being one, uh, some some others that uh, they all talk to talk to each other to a great degree. And uh, and they knew that their uh, their market primarily for uh, was exploitation films, films that were cannon fodder for drive-in theaters, which are a thing that people today, or young people anyway, don't really know much about. But it was mm-hmm. a whole culture, the drive-in mm-hmm. drive-in movie culture. And uh, so these films, I would say, were, were aimed and targeted for uh, drive-ins, although they played, of course, conventional walk-in theaters as well. Um, but that's kind of the, the genre that he was in. And coming up with films that would be or ideas, story ideas and, and scripts uh, were based on sort of a com- combination of his outrageousness, his com- feel for comedy and the ridiculous uh, and, and then serious uh, issues, too. I mean, he loved uh, he loved South Dakota. One film he did as a Western. And he got the return to the Badlands and and uh, where he grew up and everything. And he enjoyed that in a, in a serious way. But, um, but that, was, that was what he was aiming at, the drive-in theaters. And, and these films, uh, I made, you know, I think, six films. And believe me, they played a lot of drive-ins. I mean, uh, some of them were uh, in big cities like you know, Cincinnati, Cleveland, and they had multi-screen drive-ins. And they might be playing on two or five or six screens or seven screens, and and it was uh, it was big in those days. It was big. Now the properties are probably condominiums or golf courses <laughs> or something. I actually had a, a drive-in at the town I grew up in, which is one of the oldest ones left operating in the country. Really? Uh, fond fond memories of that place, and that's one of the things I tried to to get at when when I were setting up here is is just getting to the a handle on those kinds of movies and you hit it right on the head when you said the drive in culture i didn't 
have a good way to describe it. But but what do you, do you think? What was great about making those movies that we've kind of lost today? Well, uh, making movies was not. Uh, first of all, it wasn't easy, and uh, operating with um, you know thirty five millimeter film uh, is is a lot more complicated and, and expensive than than shooting on uh, in a video format, which uh, a lot of people do. Of course, film was used too. Of course. But uh, but uh, that that sort of separates the wheat from the chaff because you know film the film stock the negative stock is expensive uh, the camera equipment is expensive uh, finding somebody that's clever and talented to operate the cameras and, and things like this he was lucky he had a he had not much uh, had some money but it was a thing where. His, I think his personality and his uh, his uh, his character, something about. Him. I mean, a lot of people have bad bad actors and and uh, and technicians have bad things to say about many independent producers. However, not many have anything bad to say about Art Charles Senior, and that was because he was straight up with people. He didn't have much money to operate from, but he wanted to give them a form. Um, to show their chops and everything. And this is how he attracted people, um, very clever people, uh, both on the technical side, you know, and uh, um, one in particular is, of course, the famous uh, Academy Award winning uh, cinematographer, Bill Mo Zygmunt. Uh, my dad was the first one that gave him uh, a chance to, to shoot a low budget film, which probably in many ways, now he's passed on, but uh, uh, in many ways, early on, he, he had to have something to do, and he had a way to break in the business. Tremendous talent, but it doesn't count unless somebody helps you get in through the door, you get into the union, you know, things like that. And, uh, mm -hmm. and my dad did, did that, and I think uh, Vilmos was always grateful to him, although probably some of the films like Ega and everything, yeah, that wasn't his things that he wanted to, to point to proudly, but... Uh, uh, believe it or not, he was there, and I remember many cold nights. Uh, he slept in his car. I mean, like uh, almost just maybe a step up from being homeless. So <laughs> you know, he went on to, of course, be extremely popular and extremely successful, and was a wonderful man, wonderful talent. But uh, everybody's got to start somewhere, and he started uh, along with a colleague of his, uh, Laszlo Kovacs, and my dad used both. Of, of these uh, wonderful Hungarian uh, photographers, but uh, cinematographers, I should say. Um, what can I say? <laughs> Sounds like a pretty good guy. Yeah, and 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 uh, it, it attracted uh, it attracted a lot of good people. I think they were good. A lot of people were, you know, they'd come out of film school or or they were self-taught almost or whatever you want to call it. Uh, people like Ray Dennis Steckler. I don't know if you're familiar with him or not, but he's he's he was quite an amazing man and a, and a talented man. Not in my dad's generation, but for some reason there was a simpatico where they both got along very well, and they were almost in sync. One could think of something, and and he would be in tune with the other. You know, uh, Ray would be in, in tune with my dad, and my dad would be in tune with him. It was almost eerie sometimes, but. But it was, uh, and, and then everything, time pressure, and of course time is money when you're uh, making a film, and, and uh, sometimes we had pretty harsh conditions because we had rental equipment, we had rental uh, sound stages, things like that, and, and uh, we had it for so many hours or so many days or whatever, and building sets, and, and then we'd, uh, we'd end up having problems and getting all bogged down, but we couldn't leave. So it's like having a bull by the tail. What do you do? So mm -hmm. I remember, you know, at one point we had one major problems in a sound stage down in Hollywood, downtown Hollywood. And uh, I believe when we finally wrapped up, we had no idea we we're going to have this kind of difficulty. But we went 44 hours uh, without just taking breaks and throwing water in our face and slapping our faces, trying to stay awake, you know. But <laughs> it was. It was like sleep deprivation, torture, but um, 
but most of the time, uh, any problems we had, uh, were, we'd, we'd sort of laugh off. But it was easier, especially dealing with the police and permits and things like that. And it was easier to uh, beg for forgiveness than to ask permission and to make formal applications. So sort of guerrilla filmmaking, I mean, it's maybe done a little bit different now. And there's a lot more uh, oversight and more restrictions. Back then, there was restrictions, too. But... Uh, we just did it anyway, and uh, <laughs> and most of the time got away with it with uh, with befriending uh, the police or the sheriff's deputies. They would send out and the complainants. Uh, one time in Malibu, we were shooting wild guitar on the beach, and I'm not going to say who it was, but it was quite a famous movie star came out and just screamed and obscenities and everything. And, and we were there doing, you know, we weren't on his property, but we were adjacent to his property. And he knew we were making a film and he knew we probably didn't have a permit. So he was going to just make a big scene. And he did. And uh, anyway, LA, LASO deputy came out and asked for the permit and all of that. And, and we just did a kind of a rope-a-dope uh, exercise. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we're still finishing up the last shot because if he had kicked us off the beach we would have had to come back and that would have been more difficult. So we finished up the shot while uh, a couple of people, including my father and, um, and Ray Dennis Steckler and, and were, were kind of uh, holding this uh, deputy and entertaining him and introducing him to some young girls and everything like that, keeping him sort of mesmerized for a few minutes. And that's all we needed. I think it was about 25 minutes, and the and the the, the resident movie star there walked over and was uh, saying, "Well, what are you going to do? You're going to arrest them? You're going to, you know, where is their permit? I want to see their permit." And anyway, he's, they sort of diffused everything, uh, and the uh, the complaining party uh, walked back to his house and shaking his head like, you know, it didn't make any sense. But the only the only thing my my dad knew was that having having a bunch of scantily clad young girls around in bikinis uh, surrounding the sheriff's deputy and saying, oh, you're so handsome and everything like that. That that, that buys you a few minutes. You know, it can only help the situation. It won't hurt at all. <laughs> it worked. It worked. And that deputy was very nice, too. And, and the guy was so foul-mouthed and everything that he didn't didn't really. He just told him, sir, just, you know, I'll be over. I'll come over and talk to you. And he did. He went over and talked. And I don't think he satisfied him. He wanted his... Um, he wanted us arrested, uh, you know, booted off the beach or arrested or whatever. But uh, he didn't get his way. We got our film in the can and, and uh, tr trucks loaded up and we were beating feet out of there. So everybody was happy in the end. Nobody got hurt. So, you know, it's all good. Right? In school, I, I one of the pretty much the only thing I learned film wise was that if you get asked about the permit and you don't have one, your answer is always, I think. We have one because oh, if you say yes, they'll ask to see it. But if you if you right. hem and haw, they just don't want to bother. Right. We used to do that in, in aviation with uh, overflight permits. You know, you'd be coming from uh, Dubai, uh, flying to uh, Bangkok, let's say, and and you're entering uh, Burmese airspace, or they call Myanmar now. It's the politically correct name. And anyway, uh, you, they'd call you'd have you call Rangoon and. And the first thing you'd ask when you called up on HF uh, radio, which is very scratchy and everything, it wasn't satellite back then, or even you're too far away for VHF. So you, you hear and they ask for an overflight permit. And it's usually a long series of numbers and, and letters, sometimes letters, mostly numbers. And um, we didn't have any permits. So we would just read back a, a bunch of bogus numbers or read it off of a card or, you know, look like a driver's license number or something, just some series of numbers that sounded like it was official sounding. It, it's possible. And by the time they would go and verify that first they put it down, then they'd have to go verify it. By the time they would verify it, we were already exiting Burmese airspace <laughs> into high, high airspace. So, you know, adios, amigo. <laughs> Frequency change, please. You know, yeah, okay. Contact Bangkok Control one two five point seven zero. Bye. So long. But but you know that permit. You know, click. Oh, you know, just <laughs> hang up the phone. You know. So so that works in various different industries, I guess. But uh, we had some interesting times. Uh, Harpo Marx came out one time, and we were filming just behind his property, 
in the Palm Desert, California area. And um, he knew exactly what was going on, but he came up and of course, a couple of people recognized him right away. And uh, Ray Dennis Steckler walked over to him and I think Ray said, he said, and what's going on here? And, and he said, and Ray said, uh, I, I said, oh, well, we're doing a documentary. It's a, it's a, it's an educational thing for the Department of Education in Coachella Valley or Indio or something like that. And Harpo Marx said, "Don't lie to me. I know what you're doing." <laughs> <laughs> it was funny, but he said, "It's okay. Go ahead." He says, <laughs> so wow. it, everybody's reactions were different, you know, and uh, we had a lot of fun. Sometimes, sometimes, uh, sometimes it was tough, but uh, 122 degrees in the shade, you know, in, in the desert there, trying to shoot a film, and things are so hot you can't even touch them hardly. You know, things that are black, like camera equipment, magazine, film magazines are are so hot they're just scorching your hands because in the that's in the shade. The official temperature is if it's in the sun or on the tarmac, you know, you put anything down without a cover over it to shade it or try to get some. And it's way up there. It's uh, ridiculous. And I don't know what point the film is damaged, but I think there is some temperature that, you know, if you have a, it's up to 200 or something, I think you're, you know, but that's unlikely. But 140 mm -hmm. is, is, can do that easily. Mm -hmm. up and so, yeah, anyway. Anyway, that was, that was uh, a bit of, a uh, bit of our experience with uh, having, uh, you know, permits and permissions. And sometimes we did actually have permits and, and when it wasn't difficult and the, and the local government was, uh, you know, I remember Glendale was actually pretty, pretty friendly. Glendale and Pasadena were, were friendly places, but you get into Hollywood and Los Angeles County or Malibu, you know, then it, it, it got a little more sticky at that time. So today it's probably a uh, hundred times worse or, you know, but they probably have a whole department just dedicated to, to film filming and permits for, you know, TV and, and film crews and everything doing that. I don't know. It's been a long time since I've done any of that, but I can only imagine that uh, somebody is still asking somebody for a permit somewhere. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wonder how much of the California's uh, legal fees get paid just in permits. I mean, really. Don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. But uh, you said uh, your dad was a writer. You wrote a book a couple of years back, didn't you? Yes, I did. Yeah, I, I did. It was a, it's sort of a naughty, uh, erotic book, and uh, I did it for. Well, you might say it's a, it's sort of a uh, uh, vanity publication. I, I wanted to do something, and I, I, I got a manuscript finished, and I, I sent it around several places, and of course got turned down. But actually, got a couple, a couple that said, yeah, we're, we're interested in everything. And I said, okay, here's. Here's what I want to do. I'd like to, you know, this, and they said, whoa, 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 stop right there. What are you talking about? Said, well, I have some ideas. I want to, you know, a paperback format, but a high quality, you know. Said, no, 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 no. You, you don't get it. This is the, we're in the business. You don't know anything. <laughs> they said, you know, if, if we, you know, want to pr proceed with your manuscript, uh, it would be a hardback at first. You know, the copy would be the publisher's a hardback. And, I said, no, I don't want that. I said, you don't, that's not the way the business works. And I said, well, I don't want to do that. And uh, I said, well, then, adios, you know, pretty mm -hmm. much departed company. And I realized there was a lot, of, a lot, and there still is, of course, a lot about the business. And, of course, the whole industry is, the uh, publishing business is completely been put on its ear by e-books and things like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, so a lot of times, uh, Writers now, and I know a few few writers, are very very uh, prolific writers, and they sell uh, throughout a variety of outlets. But they also sell their books as eBooks direct to the consumer, and that's pretty neat, you know. I mean, so there's some revolutionary changes of the old way of doing things, and it's not all bad. A lot of it is very good. So, but uh, but that's that's the only. But I've got a couple of other manuscripts that are. You might say half finished, but uh, I've held those in advance. And uh, however, uh, 
I, I got back together with a, with a friend of mine who is a, a very good writer, screenwriter, as well as a journalist, investigative journalist. And he, uh, he and I have uh, come up with a uh, complete new story uh, based roughly on many of the characters in my in my book, but uh, as it turns out, it's uh, it's really really a neat script, and we only finished it just a couple of weeks ago, so we're we're pretty much jazzed on it. So uh, so I have a a new property to begin uh, uh, schlocking around, you might say, uh, to the right people. But it's not for everybody, so you know I've got a few select uh, people I'm uh, that were waiting to see it, and then others that uh, have I have plans to send it to people and all that. So we'll see, you know. But it's fun, and I and I can see there must be some DNA or something that I got from my dad because I love it. It's really you know writing and and, and coming up with characters and dialogue and things. It's uh, something. There's a very visceral um, enjoyment out of, um, especially when you're, you're working with a co-writer and you're both getting a kick out of it. And, and uh, so I, I think I'm not just some sort of a weirdo that, uh, that I mean, other people say, no, that, that's really good. That's awesome or something. It makes you feel good, you know. So mm -hmm. anyway, since uh, I don't fly the big iron jet anymore, uh, it gives me something to do, keeps me off the street. <laughs> well i'm sure you don't want to give away too many details and there's a lot that you can't talk about but i just want to let you know that i'm very interested and i'm going to be looking forward to seeing what comes of this so okay. whether it takes two months or two years you have somebody who wants to see this made okay aaron i appreciate that and uh, i will uh keep you uh keep you informed keep you in the loop for sure will do thank you um how about we start wrapping this up while we're ahead here OK, but, uh, where can somebody keep tabs on you if they want to keep track on your uh, adventures and your writing and things like that? Well, I, I, I have a I have a website that really is kind of dormant and stale. It's not a very good. Uh, uh, it's just sort of a contact point. ArchHallJr.com. Very original, right? But anyway, that uh, but other than that, mostly I've used uh, and I guess I'll continue to use it is Facebook uh, for uh, initial contacts and uh, sort of people to to uh, uh, get in touch with me. Yeah, and, you know, that's that's sort of how I operate. It's not really complicated. Probably yeah. other people, too. So at Facebook and it's Arch Hall Jr. Uh, on Facebook. Unfortunately, there's probably a lot of bogus Arch Hall Juniors, but you can probably figure out the right one by, you know, just checking it out. But Unless uh, unless it gets sabotaged in some way, I'll, I'll, I'll keep using Facebook or, you know, unless I'm uh, it, anyway, I, I enjoy it. And it but it does suck a lot of time and I, things that I should be doing, especially, you know, rewriting and editing and doing some things. Sometimes I'll get engaged with somebody on Facebook and and uh, it's a time waster, you know, uh, to be perfectly honest. But uh, I enjoy it for the socializing of it, you know. Hey, it's a good way to keep in touch with people you can't talk to otherwise. And you and I would probably have never met if it wasn't for Facebook. So I'm thankful for that. Me too. Me too. Okay. Well, have yourself a good night and take good care. And I will talk to you soon. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. I want to have you back on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Take good care.